This is in Revelation 13. And it's speaking of the beast. That is the anti-Messiah. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding compute the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Well, I'm sure you've heard that verse many times, that passage. I think as we read it, we can understand why people might think that this mark is some sort of technology that would be stamped upon or implanted into a person because whatever this mark is actually controls whether they can buy or sell anything. And really, I think before the modern era, this was far more mysterious how this could actually work. In the modern era, we have technology that actually can accomplish what this is talking about. Well, we're going to go into this verse a lot more deeply to see what the verse itself is actually saying. But before we get into that, we want to look at the 2030 agenda and see what it's actually saying about money and people and numbers of men. So let's start with this. This is from the United Nations website. They have a sustainable development knowledge platform. That's where I got this screenshot. And of course, I added the boxes and so on. So you could see this more easily. But as you look through this, you go through its many sections you'll see that this 2030 agenda for sustainable development covers every possible area of life. However, when you read some of these things, you wonder, well, what are they really saying? Because as you read it, it's a little bit mysterious. Well, here in number 16.9, Here's one of the agenda items. Now I'm quoting directly from the document. By 2030, provide legal identity for all, including birth registration. Now realize that's not just talking about developed countries. That's talking about every human being to provide legal identity. So you wonder, well, how do they plan on doing that? How do you establish that? You know, there are lots and lots of babies born around the world that are not born in hospitals. And this is especially true in poorer countries. There are no birth certificates for many of these people. So how do you establish legal identity for these people, including birth registration? where they're not even born in a hospital. What are they really thinking? Well, some of their recent activities shed some light on this, and I want to share this with you. Here's a website, Find Biometrics. They're very interested in biometrics, everything having to do with counting people by the use of biosignatures. That's your own body. 
things having to do with your own body. They're very excited about the fact that the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees plans to use biometric technology to identify and track refugees and has entered into a vendor partnership with a company called Accenture, an international technology service. Now, in the seminar, the Daniel seminar, you might remember we covered Agenda 21. Now this is carried forward to Agenda 2030. What we found there is that the UN makes partnerships with businesses and governments and NGOs. And then together, they accomplish the UN's agenda. So that apparently is what we have here, the UN teaming up with a biometrics company. And what they're doing, it says, is identifying and tracking refugees. It says that using this technology, they can collect facial, iris, and fingerprint biometric data. And it says that this information, once collected, is sent back to a central database in Geneva. Did you know that the UN had a central database in Geneva where they are collecting people's biometric data? This allows the UN officers all over the world to effectively coordinate with the central authority in tracking the refugees. Now when you read this, I think in many respects it sounds reasonable in the sense that when you have refugees, they have no documentation or anything, so using biometrics, they can assign an identity to them that will be a permanent identity, and it's a way of dealing with the refugees. Some people would say that that's quite reasonable. I think, though, that the interest is in biometrics. That's of interest to me, because this has to do with people's bodies. The UN actually has been involved in this for a while. This is from 2010. It's talking about a project in India with which the UN was involved to ID 1.2 billion people. This involved fingerprints and other kinds of biometric data, collecting a massive database of unique IDs. India turned to companies like Google, Yahoo, and Intel in order to provide technology for this. This is what they said was the reason for getting everybody ID'd so that welfare would reach the right people and for purposes of banking to allow these people banking for the first time. Well, this is interesting because where you see biometric data being brought online to identify people, what happens is you always see them mentioning banking. This is what I found in researching for this. This apparently is the real purpose, among other things, for wanting to identify everybody in the world. Now, here's a real solid proof of what I'm talking about. This is actually a photocopy of a document I downloaded from the World Bank online. And the World Bank, look at its logo. Under the word World Bank group, it says governance. What does a bank have to do with governance? That's totally UN talk, isn't it? Under the kind of government the UN is interested in, banks are part of the government, particularly the World Bank. 
Well, they have a program called Cross-Practice Initiative Identification for Development. And here's their overview of their program. Providing legal identity for all, including birth registration, by 2030 is a target shared by the international community as part of the Sustainable Development Goals. And it cites the very part of those goals which I read to you from Agenda 2030. It goes on, the World Bank Group has launched the Identification for Development Cross-Practice Initiative to help our client countries achieve this goal and with the vision of making everyone count, ensure a unique legal identity and enable digital ID-based services to all. Well, when the World Bank says this, what kind of services are they talking about? I don't think you'd be wrong to say banking services. That's what they're talking about. So they see the very provision that we read about as including IDing people for the purpose of banking services. It's interesting that you have to take this circuitous route to find out what the UN is really talking about in their Agenda 2030. But the World Bank is here telling us that, that it's really about banking, IDing people for the purposes of banking. And not just some people, all people, everybody in the world. Well, the same website, Find Biometrics, picked up on this. And they say the World Bank and Accenture call for a universal ID. Now, Accenture is the same organization that worked with the UN and probably is continuing to work with them on IDing the refugees. And when we read about that, it seemed like it was limited to the refugees. But now we find out that the World Bank is working with the same company. I'm not surprised, are you? And here, they're not just talking about IDing refugees. They're talking about a universal ID, identifying everybody having a positive identification for every person. It says here, a report synopsis notes that about 1.8 billion adults around the world currently lack any kind of official documentation. They want to get all of those people officially documented. Now, it then talks about IDing refugees in various places, and it goes on to say, the nature of the deployments has required an economically feasible solution and has demonstrated that reliable biometric ID cards can affordably be used on a large scale. So even though they didn't tell us it was just an experiment working with the refugees, now we see that's what it was was just an experiment working with the refugees to see if they could do this with everybody. This is what they do. It's like this creeping thing that you cannot stop. You know, they just keep pushing the thing forward. They know what they're doing, and they're not going to tell you as they're doing it the real reason. So it was an experiment. Now, here's the kicker on this, okay? This experiment, it says, offers hope for the UN Sustainable Development Goal of getting legal ID into the hands of everyone in the world by the year 2030 with its Identification for Development Initiative. 
Now, realize this is what the World Bank and Accenture said that's being reported here. Accenture is a company that uses biology techniques to identify people, things about your own body. So it is reasonable to conclude from this that that was, in fact, the purpose of the UN in the first place with this particular part of their Agenda 2030. They're wanting to have bio-IDs on every person so that everybody is documented. Well, how do you do that with people that never had a birth certificate or any kind of documentation? How do you identify them? Well, using biology, everybody has a unique fingerprint. There's other unique things about every person, such as your iris, other things. So they're able to assign you an ID that then goes with you because it's in the database. So regardless of whether you have any documentation to start with, once they get a hold of the biometric data from an individual, they can essentially nail down the identity of that person from that point forward. They will actually be able to assign an identity to every person in the world, provided they can get that biometric data and provided they can somehow force them to identify themselves using that data. Well, how do you force people to identify themselves who don't want to identify themselves? Because a lot of these people don't want to identify themselves to the system. Here's one way of doing it. Why don't we just get rid of all the cash? Because if you get rid of all the cash, then for people to be able to buy anything, they are going to need to prove who they are. Every person, even the very poorest person in the world, like in India, is going to have to have a bank account. They will have to prove their identity using biometric means that will stay with them at all times. And if they don't comply, if there's no such thing as cash anymore, then how are they going to be able to buy anything? How are they going to be able to transact business or even feed themselves? So getting rid of the cash is a great way to make everybody step forward and accept whatever means of identification that the system wants to impose. Well, there's been a lot in the news about this. Leading economists and various famous figures and so on have been coming forward saying that essentially we need to get rid of cash and be a cashless society. Steps are being taken to limit the use of cash, diminish it until it disappears. As it says here, governments are limiting the use of cash, and a variety of official mouthpiece economists are calling for the outright abolition of cash. It's telling us authorities are both restricting the amount of cash that can be withdrawn from banks and limiting what can be purchased with cash. So, two approaches. First of all, restricting how much cash you can take out of the bank. Now, just imagine this is your money. You put it in the bank, but the bank, under government authority, is going to limit whether you can take it out or not. And then the other thing is simply putting a limit on how much you can purchase with cash. Just simply, you know, you might have a mountain of cash in your house or something, but it's no good to you because you can't buy beyond a certain amount. This is how they're limiting the use of cash. Now let's look at the benefits of this. 
You want to sign up already, don't you? Well, there's big benefits for the banks and the government to eliminate physical cash. For instance, every single financial transaction can be taxed. So, you know, the government is real excited about that. And every time they think up a new tax, well, they don't even have to bother you with filing a return or something like that. They could just take it out of your account. Imagine how much more convenient that's going to be for you. And then, of course, the bankers like it because every financial transaction can be charged a fee. And, you know, those bankers, they work so hard for us providing all this digital money that they need to take part of it from time to time. And you don't have to worry your little head about it at all, you know, because they can just kind of withdraw that out of your account. No problem. See how convenient that is? And then other unseemly things like bank runs, totally eliminated. See how good this is? Not. And then last of all, of course, the golden rule. He who holds the gold makes the rules. Just imagine, you have no more control over money. All of your money is controlled by the bankers and the government. This is tremendous coercive power once they have this kind of control. Here's regulations from the United States for the bankers, which I also copied online. This is to the banks, and this is in America. Some of the things that I thought were interesting here, transactions conducted or attempted by at or through the bank or an affiliate and aggregating $5,000 or more if the bank or affiliate knows, suspects, or has reason to suspect the transaction, have to be reported to the government. Now, it used to be 10000 now it's 5000 That's a pretty low number nowadays. You know, there's a lot of people that pay a lot more than that, for instance, for a car, for other things. There are people who have cash businesses, who legitimately have cash businesses, but they've got to put the money through the bank first before they can make a big purchase. Really, any transaction that might involve potential money laundering or other illegal activity or is designed to evade the BSA. Money that has no business or apparent lawful purpose or is not the type of transaction that the particular customer would normally be expected to engage in. That's talking about cash transactions. Those are considered suspect, and you can get reported to the government. Now, people who have absolutely no reason to fear because they're not doing anything wrong, anything illegal, are reported to the government just because they used cash to buy something. And once that report is made, what do you think happens after that? You know, worst case scenario, that can follow you around for the rest of your life and cause you all sorts of problems. Nobody wants to go there. It's not just criminals that don't want to go there. Nobody wants to have the government having this kind of control over their life. So what is the effect of that on the use of cash? People aren't going to use it, right? Because they know that this is going to happen. In America, this is happening, the land of the free. But then in other countries, it's even getting worse. For example, in France, in September 2015, a new law was implemented that prohibits French residents from making cash payments of more than 1,000 euros. 
And the last time I looked at euros, but just going on that, for instance, in America here, that'd be $1,500. You can't buy something that costs more than that using cash. It's just plain against the law. Why? Well, the French finance minister explained it this way. It was necessary to fight against the use of cash and anonymity in the French economy. That's a war on cash. This is from an article from the Credit Suisse Bank in one of their journals. The headline is, Sweden, we don't accept cash. The article tells you everywhere you go in Sweden, there are signs up that say, we don't accept cash. And then they tell us how this happened. The six largest Nordic banks have been gradually weaning themselves, I would say the population, off of cash since 2010. You see, they've been working along with the UN for a while in the UN agenda and the World Bank. And while they may be ahead of other places in the world in implementing this agenda, this is just a picture of things to come for the rest of the world. And why do I say the UN? Well, look at how they sum this up. By 2030, we will be completely cash-free. You think they just grabbed the number 2030 out of the sky? This is happening in compliance with the 2030 agenda. Well, here's an interesting guy. A.J. Banga, the president and CEO of MasterCard. You don't think he's friendly with the UN, do you? A.J. Banga loves to talk about the wonders of a cashless society. Goes on to tell about a meeting he had with all of his senior people, telling them how evil cash is. It's hard to track. It's used for drugs, weapons, and tax evasion. And it's expensive for the bank to make. So, we've got to get rid of it. Here's his way of doing it. It's called a smart card. Now, in Europe, a good part of the world, they've been using smart cards for quite a long time. We've had them in America, but they didn't catch on. Smart cards include an integrated circuit, a micro controller that can store large amounts of data and carry on their own on-card functions. Really, what you're talking about is a little computer that is included in the card that continues to update the information inside the card. Now, this is incredibly useful in terms of controlling people's behavior because messages can be transmitted to the card as an ongoing, real, live thing. The use of the card can be monitored, which gives much greater control to the merchants and the banks. And smart card technology conforms to international standards. So this is the basic level right now of where we're at in terms of a cash-free society. Smart cards. Now, here from Fortune magazine, from an article interviewing Carolyn Balfany, a vice president from MasterCard. It explains that 1.2 billion credit and debit cards in circulation in the U.S., of that many, some 70% will have chips by the end of 2015. So 
The American consumer has not wanted to use the smart cards, so they haven't. However, what has happened is the bank has changed the deal with the merchants. And as of October 1st, any merchant who doesn't have the point of sale hardware for the smart card will then be held responsible for any fraudulent charges that go through their terminal. Whereas in the past, the bank has insured against that. So the merchants aren't going to be willing to take that risk of having to pay up for fraud. And so they are massively upgrading to these chip-capable terminals and massively refusing the old kind of cards. America is being essentially forced to go on to smart cards whether they want them or don't want them. Carolyn Balfany explained about this. This is a direct quote. We want to make sure we're adding acceptance constantly to further our war on cash. You see, the smart cards aren't where they're really headed. They're just a step along the way in their war on cash. Whose war? Our war. Well, she works for MasterCard. She could be saying MasterCard's war on cash. But I think she's referring to the bigger war on cash sponsored by the World Bank and the entire banking community and the United Nations. That's what I think she's really talking about. What do we mean about acceptance? You know, when you read some of these articles, you would think that people just can't wait for a cashless society. But the truth is, people don't want it. And so, acceptance has to be forced on them gradually. And that's really what she's talking about. Until they finally get people to the point where they will accept a cashless society. In her own words, she's telling us exactly what is happening. And what we've seen is, this is all supposed to happen by 2030. And so this is why we see a lot of changes regarding payments. This man wrote a book about it called Digital Bank. Chris Skinner. He says, we already have contactless payment terminals, fingerprint recognition payments, micro and mobile payments. The only logical step is to introduce non-card based, i.e. biometric based payment systems. What is he saying? What does this picture say? We want to get rid of the cards. We want this biometric-based system to be based in your own body. This was kind of an interesting article in Time magazine from last year. And the title's interesting, Never Offline. This is from the magazine. How wearable tech will change your life, like it or not. Will make people and computers more intimate. You want to be more intimate with your computer? I'm thinking not. Will bring us one step closer to human-machine symbiosis. That's the human and the machine becoming one. This is Time Magazine talking. This is not the Sci-Fi Channel or something. They're telling us where they're going with all of this, and they're telling us that it's going to happen whether we like it or don't like it. There will be computers that are actually attached to our bodies. That's what they're saying. 
Now, they're going to be used for a lot of different things. They're going to be connected to the Internet all the time, which means if you have human-machine symbiosis, meaning that you are one with the machine, that means that you personally will be hooked up to the Internet all the time. And we know how the Internet works. It's a two-way thing, isn't it? You can get information off of the Internet, but the Internet can get information from you. How much control could the system have over you if you were forced, like it or not, to have something like this connected to or even essentially a part of your own body? You were augmented, as they say, with a computer. Doesn't this sound crazy? You know, as I'm talking about this, I'm thinking, nobody's going to believe this because this is crazy. But, you know, it is Time Magazine. And the truth is, some things have happened this year that I would have thought would never happen. 15 years ago or even less and they did happen and there's a big push for this and let me tell you if the World Bank and MasterCard and the whole rest of the banking community the technology community and the governments all want this like it says here this is going to change your life whether you like it or don't like it well how extreme can this get how about this? A flexible electronic tattoo directly embedded onto human skin. That's not just a decoration, but it can have a decoration over it. There's pictures of these, and they look like a tattoo, like they'll have somebody's face or something like that. But here's one up a little closer. It's really very complex. And they can do all kinds of different electronic tasks with these. Interestingly, they are powered by your own body. They tap right into your body in order to power the device. They have various kinds of sensors that can sense what your body is doing photo detectors, gauges, wireless communication. Again, totally hooked up with the Internet to hook you up to the Internet. Well, what do you think? What is life going to be like when there's no cash, there are no credit cards because they won't service them anymore, and they tell you, what we do now is we have this tattoo. You have to put that on. Are you going to do it? If you don't do it, how are you going to get by? You see, I'm not even suggesting to you that this device in itself is the mark of the beast. I personally don't believe that a certain technology per se, is the mark of the beast. But I do believe it's involved with the mark of the beast. So, in other words, when you look at this, this could be used in a way that might not be offensive. However, if you're forced to use it all the time, to wear it all the time, be connected to the Internet all the time, you don't have any control over the input that it sends in to you and your body or the output of what it extracts from you. Well, is that ethical? Is it moral? Is that in harmony with the scriptures that tell us that our Creator owns us? You can see the problems you get when you get to this point where they're beginning to try to force you to use this technology. 
And I think this is why a lot of people in America have resisted the smart cards. And you know, for a while, people thought that barcodes were it. Myself, I never believed that. But you can understand why people thought that, because it involves numbers, it involves a mark that identifies something, and no doubt it is or was a precursor of whatever the technology is going to be that will be used by the New World Order, the One World Government. There's been other things, you know, the transmitters that they inject underneath the skin. There are quite a few people that have those right now. This, however, is on the surface of your skin, but it connects to your body. And it has a kind of a glue that sort of becomes one with your skin and attaches this to your body. In 15 years, what will we have? What will the technology be? If already they have this technology that can connect to the internet and connect to you and can be used for making payments, what are they going to have in 15 years, and how is it going to interface with you? I'm concerned about that because there is a big push towards this. Well, let's get back to looking at the mark. The word translated mark here. The Greek word means a scratch or etching, a stamp as a badge of servitude. That's really what the mark means. It's some type of a stamp on your body, some sort of an etching or scratch. You know, that really reminds me of a computer chip when I hear that that is a badge of servitude. Servitude to whom? Well, whoever controls the funds, right? It says, let him who has understanding compute the number. You might think that I added the word compute for effect or something, but I didn't. What you're seeing here is from Strong's Dictionary of Greek Words. And the word that I've translated here is compute, which is often also translated as count or calculate, is actually translated as compute in Strong's Dictionary. You see the word right there, to compute. So this is interesting. This mark has to do with computing. Now, this word to compute is related to a couple other Greek words, basically different forms. It has to do with a pebble, which is as a token, as a verdict or a ticket. In other words, it gives you access. Yes or no, you get access. And then the other meaning is verify by contact. I thought that was interesting. Verification. So right within the Greek language that this is all translated from is it's using lots of computer terms. Computing, a ticket, verification. What is this if it's not some sort of an identification? involving computing. You know, when people talk about it being some kind of technology, it's not only that it's logical, but the thing is, as you look into the language in the Greek, the wording is really there. The definition is really there to suggest something having to do with a computer that verifies who the person is. Well, here's another thing. 
Compute the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. What is the number of a man? I have a number in my wallet. It's called my social security number. It's my number. You know what? If I wanted to, I could tell you right now what my social security number is. It's probably one of the only numbers that I actually remember of any length. Other numbers in my life have changed, but that number I've had all my life. It was never supposed to be an ID number, but we all know it is. It is the number of a man. It's a number of this man, of a certain man. Nobody else has that number because it's assigned to me. Am I proud of it? No. It all happened before I had anything to do with it, but I'm stuck with it. It's the number of a man. Compute the number of a man. Whoa. Is this not talking about modern technology that identifies a person? The number of the beast, therefore, would be not just that type of number. Like, for instance, let's say it's a social security number, which is the number of a man. The number of the beast would be his specific social security number. Just like I could tell you, mine, right now. Nobody else has it. Well, he also will have a specific ID number that is connected with the mark. And if you belong to him, so will you. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So you see, not only do you have in this mark an identification of who you are. But the mark represents a relationship between you and the beast. And it contains, besides your information, the mark or the name of the beast. It's kind of like on money, on a coin or on paper money. It has the name of whoever mints that coin. It goes back to the time of Yeshua and before, right? He held up the coin and he said, whose picture is on the coin? What's different about the mark is that the mark brands the recipient as the property of the beast. Because this image is not on a piece of paper in your wallet, identifying the piece of paper as belonging to the issuer. This mark is on your body. So it is identifying you as belonging to the issuer, whom in this case is... The beast. And we know from other scriptures what the beast is going to do. Paul told us he's going to go right into the temple of God claiming that he is God. That's what you'll have to buy into to receive this mark. You will have to agree with that to have his name affixed to you. Is that not idolatry? You shall have no other gods before me. So, a person that does this and receives this mark, making themselves the property of the beast, the anti-Messiah, 
They have stepped over a line, and now they belong to the other side. And there's a lot reinforcing that. Because once a person takes that step, and they've stepped across the line, and they have accepted that mark, they are now totally dependent on that B system, are they not? They can be totally controlled because they can't buy or sell unless they have the mark. You see, once you make that compromise, it's very unlikely that you would ever turn around the other way. It's your moment of decision. This is your moment of decision as to who you are going to be and what your eternal future is going to be. This is no small thing. You are taking the name of the beast. The name of the beast, the mark of the beast, is the key to success in the beast system. You know, when I read about Mr. Banga and all of the rest of the bankers that get all excited about the cashless society, they are excited about it. A lot of those people, they seem to be a lot more excited about what is coming down the pike and what it means for them than a lot of believers seem to be about Messiah, to tell you the truth. And I'll tell you the reason they're so excited about it, because they're part of the system that will benefit. They know that this is going to be a big thing for them. They're going to make a lot of money. They're going to be a big success in the system. The only problem with all of that is Success in the beast system is bought by surrender of total control to the beast system. You see, to get all of that, that the mark is going to open up for the person, they have to give total control over to the system. Because once you take that mark, they're able to track you everywhere you go. They're able to track your money everywhere it goes. They're able to tax you. They're able to take it away from you. They're able to coerce you. You are then a total slave. And you know, while I'm telling you this, I have to say it, you're not far from that right now, right? I mean, a lot of us, we're not far from that right now. We are living paycheck to paycheck. And, you know, we feel very controlled many times by the system. And we're feeling this. You know, the system is trying more and more to control you. Debt really, really makes it worse. You know, the more you want the stuff and you're willing to go into debt for it, the more control the system has over you. Well, the mark of the beast is taking all of that to a whole new level that really I think most of us can't even imagine at this point in time. And the aim, as we have seen, is to bring every single person on earth into the system and to make you hurt if you resist that. Here's why you don't want to do it. One reason. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is prepared unmixed in the cup of his anger. It's telling you, if you take the mark of the beast, you're going to share the same fate as the beast. Because you belong to him. That may seem harsh, not. It's a choice you made if you take the mark. And let me tell you something, 
you are responsible for the choices you make. And not only that, you know in advance, right? The passage goes on, here is the patience of the holy ones, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Yeshua. You notice who the holy ones are? They're distinguished here as the ones who keep the commandments of God. To them, the commandments are not done away with. They are keeping the commandments, including the one that says you must worship no other God. And they keep the faith of Yeshua. And there is no contradiction between the two. So, is this talking about what we think of as Christians today? It clearly isn't. Because in most of the Christian world, the commandments of God are out the window. You know, that is talking about the Torah. The commandments. When you say the commandments... What commandments specifically come to mind? Is this not the Ten Commandments that form the covenant that Yahweh made with his people Israel? But this is very encouraging because it doesn't say that these holy ones who keep the commandments and the faith of Yeshua are all going to be killed because they don't take the mark. It says this is patience for them. What do you need patience to do? Isn't it wait? They're waiting for this to all be over. Well, how is that possible? <laughs> it's because they're in a place of safety. 